Hi strangers, I finally finished this goddamn video and it only took over a year. Fuck yeah, it's August now. I'm off the street. I found a new place. Sorry about the hiatus. It's over. I'm back. Let's boogie. This video began last summer as a, a pretentious response to Bo Burnham's 2021 Netflix special Inside. You might have heard of it. Every fucking buddy's been spewing their takes for so long. Your grandma probably knows about Inside by now. And as further evidence for how passe commentary on Inside has become, Burnham himself dropped the Inside Out takes on the premiere anniversary of Inside. In hour-long complimentary video that was uh, basically its own thing, and it reframed the entire fucking project in a new and interesting way, and I, I can only write and rewrite this shit so fast. I'm a production team of one. <laughs> but Maya, why are you so obsessed with finishing this video? Because this isn't just about Bo Burnham. I'm not just a critic, I'm an artist and a storyteller, and like all artists, I have to make everything about myself. As you see, this essay is a very personal one, and the reason keeping up with inside discourse is a pain in the ass is not because of the text itself, but how I emotionally relate to it and interpret it keeps shifting and changing. I've done a lot of changing lately, Residential transients will shake a bitch up. So, time to run it one more time. You can tell them anything if you just make it funny, make it rhyme. And if they still don't understand you, then you will run it one more time. Bo Burnham is a comedian, musician, writer, director, editor, producer, and one of the first content creators on YouTube. In the 16 years he's been on the scene, he's been a unique artist whose blending of performance art, experimental theater, and musical comedy made him one of the most incisive and insightful comic voices of the 2010s. As he's transitioned into directing and, in the wake of the pandemic, experimentation with content cinema, like Inside and the Inside Out takes, Burnham has remained an increasingly influential creator. And that doesn't look to be changing anytime soon. So, let's look at the strange story of Bo Burnham's creative evolution. Hi gang, uh, just woke up so I thought I'd serenade you with a song about my life and something I need to come to realize and all of you should come to realize. Take it as it is, digest it, use it as you will. Bo Burnham was born in 1990. When he was 16, he filmed himself playing a song he wrote for his brother called My whole family thinks I'm gay. See, it's funny because he's not actually gay. Do you get it? My whole family now is shocked. I'm in the closet and the door is locked. Do you get it? it it's funny. You all probably think I'm gay. Man, this song is counterproductive. It's funny. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you... So since I started so young, basically every shitty joke there's a lot of material that I'm just really embarrassed by and makes me cringe and um, just edgy, stupid. Yeah, it doesn't hold up. But I'm not gay and that's what I said. If I'm gay, then God strike me dead. That's weird. See, this was 2006 and that's where we were at. That's what we thought was funny. So Bo Burnham became one of the first viral celebrities off YouTube, playing silly, offensive, painfully adolescent songs in his childhood bedroom. The entertainment industry, early in the days of trying to figure out the best ways to market to the new internet generation, snatched him up. And by the time he turned 18, he was performing stand-up professionally and was the youngest ever comedian to do a Comedy Central special. Instead, let's start with this first special really worth talking about, 2010's Words, Words, Words. It's a pretty straightforward introduction to the core elements of Burnham's style and content, such as they're heavily scripted. In Words, 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 the show's entire script is written on these tablets lining the stage. They're literally set in stone. This song isn't funny at all, but it helps me sleep at night. And the title comes from a scene in Hamlet. What do you read, my lord? What? <laughs> what? What? When the depressed titular twink is mocking his fag hag's fishmonging father to his face. Well, the satirical rogue says here that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, and that they have a most plentiful lack of wit. Well, but does so in an oblique, amusing, passive aggressive fashion. I powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. For you yourself, sir, should be as old as I am. If you like a crab, you could go backward. And this is an accurate representation of Bo Burnham's attitude towards his audiences and culture at the time. Bo's jokes and routines are wall to wall, ruthless, bitter fluctuations between social and self awareness. One of his defining and consistent qualities is the Shakespearean way he conceals sharp social criticisms and deep deeply affecting emotions within dense wordplay, poetic metaphors, and rudimentary, unremarkable 
remarkable poppity beats. When I say hey, you say ho. Hey. Ho. Hey. Ho. That's basically how Hitler rose to power. I read recently that there are over 22 million people living with HIV AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, it was a Snapple fact. How do we fix it? This. Because laughter, laughter is the best medicine, you know, besides medicine. Words, Words, Words reads as a pointed response to the comedy of the day, in a time when culture was particularly cruel, hypocritical, and delusional. Stand-up comedy is actually pretty easy. If you're an Asian comic, just say, my mother's got the weirdest fucking accent. Then just do a Chinese accent. Everybody laughs at the Chinese accent because they privately thought that your people were laughable, and now you've given them the chance to express that in public. Comedy? Oh my god, comedy was a fucking wasteland. This was the decade after Seth MacFarlane started The Darkest Timeline by surviving 9-11 and then making a show some somehow 10 times worse and 100 times more socially poisonous than South Park. This was when Larry the Cable Guy was considered funny enough to voice a major character in a Pixar movie, back when those were respectable. This was not only when ventriloquism was passable as comedy, but the funniest and most popular one had a puppet called Achmed the Dead Terrorist, which we found hilarious. This is after we started giving Judd Apatow enough money to invent Seth Rogen and James Franco in a lab and make movies with them. Kevin James, spoof movies, The Office. Yeah, I fucking said it. Fuck that show. Even It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, a show I love by the best modern-day forward-thinking satirists, had a recurring character they exclusively referred to as The Tr Hey! Carmen, yeah. you look great. Sweet camel toe. You have a tape back there? It's, it's actually gone. I had the surgery. It's going good, pal. But uh, the lady isn't interested. I would like you to meet my husband, Nick. You're married. And while we were giving Louis C.K. primetime fucking Emmy Awards for his narcissistic Woody Allen bullshit piss-ass excuse for a comedy show, Bo Burnham was the kid pointing out that the emperor was naked and jerking off at us. And if I die happy, the situation will be autoerotic asphyxiation. And I masturbate because I'm the only one whose standards are low enough to fuck me. Bo Burnham also distinguishes himself as one of the only goddamn humorists of his generation who actually knows what the word irony means and the difference between ironic and facetious. This is something a little bit morbidly ironic. My grandmother, she was a cancer, and she was actually killed by a giant crab. <laughs> or a girl, a girl who's terrible at grammar, saying, Mama, you raised me good, and then being pushed down a well. <laughs> Symmetry. But the thing that really defines Bo Burnham's work for me is the overt sincerity at the heart of all his comedy. The song isn't funny at all, but it helps me sleep at night. The climax of Words, Words, Words is the song Art is Dead, wherein Bo drops his character and explicitly spells out his conflicted feelings, his frustrations, his disgust with the industry, society, and his role in both. The heart is a dead. So people think you're funny. How do we get those people's money? We're rolling in dough while Carlin rolls in his grave. If you take it seriously, and you should, like all art, it screams with a genuinely moving sincerity. I must be demented to think that I'm worthy of all this attention, all of this money you worked really hard for. I slept in late while you worked at the drugstore. The show has got a budget. All the poor people, way more deserving of the money, won't budget. Cause I wanted my name in lights. When I could have fed a family of four for 40 fucking fortnights. This wasn't a vulnerability, folks seen in mainstream comedy and entertainment, audiences didn't really know how to respond to it, made even more so by the fact that he was a kid. And really that was the tone setter for what was to come, both in terms of Bo's comedy and our society as a whole. So Words 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 was successful enough that Bo could finance his next specials himself, What and Make Happy. These pieces are two very experimental shows that combine elements of performance art, musical comedy, live theater. They were both critically acclaimed, but in my opinion, as with all of Bo's work, they're still both very underrated in the ways that really matter. I could literally go on all day about the specific readings I have of nearly every fucking joke and routine in this guy's entire body of work, but if I let myself get caught up in that, again, I'll never finish this video. And as I said, Bo Burnham isn't the ultimate point of this whole thing, but rather a jumping off point for bigger things. That being said, let's jump into a few examples from What and Make Happy that really illustrate beautifully both what deeper things he is trying to tell us and how he does so. What is a response to the question of its own strangeness? What indeed is what? While on the outside it is structured and presented the way it is, every piece of what is connected by a single conceptual thread. The story of himself that Bo Burnham is telling us. It's experimental poetic autobiography. The show is literally framed by home video footage of Bo performing on command as a kid, and all of it kind of flows from that. I won't take this whole show apart, but the seven minute seemingly random miming routine opening the show covers most of what I'm talking about, so 
Let's break down this nonsense. First, we get an introduction to our protagonist by an omniscient narrator. This is Bo Burnham. He's isolated himself in pursuit of comedy. In doing so, has lost touch with reality. You're an asshole, Bo. You think you know better than everybody. You will die alone. But in the meantime, you might as well tell those silly jokes of yours. See if that helps. Then Bo bombastically launches into his show, uncomfortably and obnoxiously antagonizing his audience. But then, he becomes as a child again. Bo's 20-year-old cynicism melt into childlike wonder. And in this state of innocence, he finds a fairy and pursues it. A fairy so beautiful that he felt proud about being called one in high school. The concept this fairy represents is repeated over and over and over again in Burnham's oeuvre. Be it as a fairy, a beautiful frog girl, his theoretical daughter, or a chicken. Um, this is a song about... Uh, chicken. In a word, happiness. Walking to Memphis, becoming a dentist, anything but this. But he's spent his whole life pursuing something that will make him happy. I just wanna feel good. So as a youth, chasing his dreams leads him out into the world, a world whose harsh realities he's been sheltered from. He then came across an old bridge with a troll standing guard. For the last time, man, I'm not a troll. I'm homeless. Okay, do you have any spare change? Okay, that's a used napkin. He crosses the bridge into the spotlight. As Bo arrived on the other side of the stage, the fairy's been replaced with a pentacorn. He saw a unicorn with five horns right in front of him. Possibly representing his biggest fan base at the time, teen girls. I was told very often that I was like a comedian only for 13 year old girls, and like, fuck yeah, I am. You know what I mean? I feel really proud of that. They deserve to, uh, be paid attention to and to be taken seriously. Then we get a taste of what Burnham is going to spend the next hour reiterating over and over again. I'm looking for you for quite a long time. The entertainment industry is predatory. It uses celebrities like him to psychosocially and economically prey on the vulnerable, growing internet generation. Seriously, Bo Burnham is one of the most sincere, think of the children artists out there. Young ones, listen up. You know, maybe allowing giant digital media corporations to exploit the neurochemical drama of our children for profit? Mommy let you use her iPad. You know, maybe that was a bad call. And it did all the things we designed it to do. And you got all these young fans. Now look at you. Which is great because young people, they're very reliable consumers. You unstoppable watchable. But the contradiction is, he has to be one of these entertainers. We know it's not right. We know it's not funny, but we'll stop beating this dead horse when it stops spitting out money. And it's this contradiction that fucks with him. Capitalism, I'm trapped. It's terrible. I'm a horrible person. He uses Godzilla to present this hypocrisy. It's so hard to be a lizard. It's fucked up that he gets paid to stand on stage and bitch about how unhappy he is. That lizard part was pretty fucking stupid, anyway. While most of humankind has real problems, like homelessness, lack of access to essential resources, and the deprivation of basic human rights. If I had a dime for every time a homeless guy asked me for change, I'd still say no. <laughs> no. Nope. The world is not funny. 12% of the world's population does not have access to clean drinking water. These cannons cost $200 just for that joke. I could give that money to a homeless person, make their day, and I don't do that very often. When I could have fed a family of four for 40 fucking fortnights. As part of the entertainment industry, he's a part of the problem. Being a comedian isn't being an insensitive prick capitalizing on the most animalistic impulses of the public, it's being a hero. And I fear that comedy won't help and the fear is not unfounded. The world isn't sad. <laughs> The world's funny. I'm a sociopath. 
This routine is the overture, a condensed version of the whole composition right at the beginning. The rest of what details his rise to fame. I moved to um, Hollywood recently from Boston, where I grew up, and he places. His concurrent mental health struggles. If he's feeling unhappy, it's because you failed him. All right, all right, all right, Brain, we're gonna do comedy together, all right? All right, let Brain, I'll do comedy with you. We can fix them like this. We can make him happy again. The changing of his perspective and priorities. Andy the Frog in particular is a storybook type parable. Once upon a time, there was a frog named Andy. Ooh. Warning against pursuing fame. Across the pond stood the most beautiful frog Andy had ever seen. And then she was gone. I need to go find her, said Andy. I need to follow my little frog heart. A desire that comes from a sincere place, but ultimately it's a system that will devour you. He then came across a giant crocodile. I woke up this morning and I sat on a log. I opened up the menu. The menu said frog. And he said, no, please let go of me. I can feel myself dying. You're ripping out my insides. I'm never going to find her, am I? Fuck! The end. A shaggy frog story. The moral of that story is irrelevant because we're humans. Why? Would it apply to us? Oh, and of course, the toxicity of parasocial relationships mediated by capitalism. I I'm giving you attention, girl that's wooing. Are you, are you happy now? You love me? That's very nice. You love the idea of me. You don't know me, but that's okay. It's called a parasocial relationship. It goes one way and is ultimately destructive. But please, keep buying all my shit forever. That's how it works. Capitalism, I'm trapped. It's terrible. I'm a horrible person. Yes, Bo Burnham was warning us about parasocial relationships by name back in 2013. If what works as an autobiography, Bo's next special, Make Happy, works like an essay, centered around a single thesis. and they are manipulating you. It's like advertising. You deserve better. I'm not saying I'm it, but I'm the guy that says you deserve better. You go get better. You say, thank you, weird man. Bye. A more direct warning about the entertainment industry and the way it's fucking up our ideas of each other and ourselves. Anyone watch us celebrity lip syncing? It's the end of culture. How is this entertainment? People we've seen too much of mouthing along to songs we've heard too much of. Fuck these people. How dare they think that them fucking around is worthy of your attention? Your attention's a valuable thing. <laughs> over I'm not talking into his dick now I didn't rip off his dick the show is a series of discreet bits <laughs> that one's over god you don't get that I will also refrain from deconstructing Make Happy piece by piece, because you can do that on your own time. Also, I worry about seeming redundant because the whole show is capped off with a perfect summation of everything it's trying to say. He breaks from his onstage persona after a few distractions. To summarize the show, though, me, me, me. If you take one thing away from my show, I hope it's a t-shirt. We're selling them out there. This is all a front for the brand. But what is the show about? What do you think, industrial piping? Close. Stay out of it. It's about... Mute this. But for real. What is it about? Then he talks straight to us. It's about performing. I started performing very young as a comedian. You're supposed to talk about what you know. And what I knew always was performing. But I worried that making a show about performing, it wouldn't be relatable to people that aren't performers. But what I found is that I don't think anyone isn't. And I was just taught express myself and have things to say. And I think everyone was taught that. And most of us found out no one gives a shit what we think. So we flock to performers by the thousands because we're the few that have found an audience and then I'm supposed to get up here and say, follow your dreams as if this is a meritocracy. It is not. Social media, it's just the market's answer to a generation that demanded to perform. So the market said here, perform everything to each other all the time for no reason. I know very little, but what I do know is that if you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. And then the infamous Kanye rant. I'll be honest, my problems not as high stakes as Kanye's, but I have problems. The zenith of Burnham's live performance career thus far. I got lots of shit to say. And now it's time to talk about Pringles cans and overstuffed burritos. I can't fit my hand inside a Pringle can. The Pringles can, Jim, and burrito are all metaphors. The Pringles are happiness. What I'm trying to say is the diameter of Pringle cans is way too small. All any of us wants is to be happy. I'll say it again, the diameter of Pringle cans is way too small. The system system is designed to keep happiness from us. If you feel me, put your hands up. Look at all these hands that are way too big to fit inside a Pringle can. You think you can? I know you can. Pringles, listen to the people. Despite the fact that the fix is very simple. Just make them wider. I've overdone the Pringles thing. And what does Sorry. Bo use to represent his own idea of happiness? 
I want to have a daughter so I can finally have someone around the house who can fit their hands in a Pringle can. Yes, I'm still on the Pringle can thing. Huh. I'll move on. But that is priority numero uno. I don't go to the gym because I'm self-conscious about my body. But I'm self-conscious about my body because I don't go to the gym. The gym represents the vicious cycle of irony, arresting our development and has us making the same mistakes and following our worst impulses to apocalyptic ends. And ultimately, he can't do anything about it as a comedian because as an entertainer, he's invested in the status quo remaining intact. He can't pay his rent if he isn't getting paid by the system in one way or another. Irony can be so painful. The burrito. When a Chipotle got myself a chicken burrito. The burrito's fame. I got like all these ingredients, and then at the end of the line, the guy tried to wrap the burrito, but half of the shit inside the burrito spilled out. Fame may seem like a good thing, a dream worth pursuing, but that's a lie. Fame is too much for any individual to handle. We're not meant to have so many eyes on us at once. I wouldn't have gotten half this shit if I knew it was gonna fit in the burrito. And then, he abandons his silly metaphors to speak to us without ambiguity or diversion. I wanna please you. But I want to stay true to myself. It's the dialectic tension at the center of Burnham's work. A part of me loves you. A part of me hates you. A part of me needs you. A part of me fears you. The audience is not at his mercy. I don't think that I can handle this right now. It's the other way around. They're just staring at me like, come and watch the skinny kid with a steadily declining mental health. Bo Burnham's audiences have, like all fandoms, been punctuated by streaks of toxicity in the case of words, 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 actual abuse and harassment. I'm keeping them. <laughs> this is a listening show. You done? <laughs> no. Do not objectify me, okay? I think it's okay just because I'm a dude. Do it. I think it's okay because he's a dude. That is homophobia. Just the fact that you find it funny. Ooh, a guy said take off your pants. That's not God's way. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you bigots. But the most complicated aspect of this toxic relationship are Bo's panic attacks, which he began experiencing for the first time on stage while touring with What. He talks about them explicitly in Inside, cites them as his reason for retirement from live performance in 2016. I quit because I was beginning to have uh, severe panic attacks while on stage. This onstage anxiety is where Make Happy came from. Maybe we can work this out, not break up. It was really? a breakup special. It's very literal. No, lick my clip. I cannot handle performing in front of you people. You think three lousy tears offset three years of shit? It this, gives yeah. me panic attacks. I deserve better than you. I want to stop, and I did. You're not what I need, hon. Lick this clip and leave, son. I'm not trying to psychoanalyze Bo Burnham here. I'll reiterate, I, I don't know the guy. He hasn't really elaborated on what specifically triggered his panic attacks. This is just me noticing the correlations because his live shows did start going a certain way as he got more famous. Remember this? You love me? That's very nice. You love the idea of me. You don't know me. But... This came back around and make happy. I love you. No, you fucking don't. Bo's fans made this a thing. Stop participating. Not a participatory thing going on up here. This is a listening show. I'm trying to immortalize something I've worked on for a long time. Shut up! An increase of disruptive, even hostile interruptions in his very carefully scripted, deeply personal show. I have two things to say to the types of people who heckle any sort of live performance. First, why? Second, fuck all of you in the ear with a rusty chainsaw. None of you are going to heaven. It's not reasonable to expect a performer to perform in front of crowds this confrontational, even if they mean well. I'm just happy he left us to take care of himself instead. Anyways, concurrent with Bo's escape from the spotlight, the nihilism of internet, social media, age comedy reached a breaking point. Our irreverence and self-aware edginess turned a bad joke into the figurehead of the late American empire. I blame comedy for 80% of it. I do, swear to God. It's his medium. He learned everything he, he needed to learn at the Comedy Central Roast. It's not a joke, learned everything. Everything. It's funny. In 2016, funny became scary. Like I said a while ago, this is so much bigger than Bo Burnham, or even comedy as a whole. This is about art and storytelling, and the collectives of individuals who create the conceptual building blocks on which our modern world is built. So now, let's talk about the conceptual building blocks on which our modern world is built.
So there are two dimensions to human history. There's our physical reality, wherein we reached the anatomically modern Homo sapiens about 200,000 years ago. We've been around for a long time. It wasn't a utopia, but we also weren't inventing guns and killing each other en masse, so there's that. However, the dimension of history we mean 99.9% .9 of the time we talk about history is the story as we've been telling and recording it. This version of history is a bundle of narratives, wherein we began a few millennia ago, once we started writing shit down and building taller walls. The grand narrative of human history can be told in countless different ways, so keep this in mind because I'm as much an authority on history as any other human being who wasn't actually there while it was happening. This is just me as a storyteller and a sociologist trying to simplify the story of human civilization to make salient points about the world today. Civilization happens about 12,000 years in our past, when groups of people start coming together and growing in such numbers that systems of power are cultivated around them. We settle down, we build houses and become farmers, irrigation and farming leads to a surplus of food, we make bigger grain silos to store it. We build walls to stop our food from being taken and we stand guard over them. But little by little, as it gets bigger and bigger, through a variety of factors, the system is twisted into a system of unequal power and distribution, wherein the few keep the most resources for themselves, and they use this inequality, this implicit threat of starvation, to enforce their rule. Like, for example, paying the guards to keep all the poor and hungry people out of the silos unless they submit to the will of the powerful and privileged. And thing was, this is an ancient time, so city walls are still preferable to the tigers and thunderstorms outside of them, even if the guy with the keys is an asshole in a shiny headband demanding hefty portions of your resources at sword point. Civilization is a snowball, and once it starts rolling, it doesn't stop. Today, it's still rolling. So for our purposes, our history is the story of the development of human thought, emotion, imagination, and social organization as we formed increasingly interconnected and bigger groups. It is a combination of sociology, art history, and critical theory. Chapter 1, Ancient History, ends around 500 CE, about 1500 years ago, when these early civilizations become too top-heavy and imbalanced with power and collapse. Because you simply cannot build a tower that reaches heaven. You cannot have an empire that covers the world. And the most well-known of these empires by English speakers, and the most relevant one to our subject of discussion and analysis, is the Roman Empire. Chapter 2, The Middle Ages, Humankind's Terrible Twos. From about 500 to 1500 CE, civilizations become increasingly interconnected, for better and worse. The Roman Empire buys out Christianity and rebrands into the Roman Catholic Church, keeping dominance over the people by controlling literacy and access to knowledge. Remember, the power of kings was considered a matter of divine authority. The big man's laws and rules were written down in this book. Imagine how easy it would be to convince people who are afraid of thunderstorms to do whatever you say, give you as much money as you want, and adopt your principles of morality as the immutable law of nature when you're the only one in the area who can read that fucking book. You'd be able to dominate art, philosophy, science, culture, and politics, all with the authority of God, the only power higher than kings. It's not until the printing press is invented in the early 1400s that literacy becomes more accessible to the people subjugated by power. And when you have a general population that knows how to read, they become a lot harder to subjugate because they start talking to each other, connecting as human beings in a common struggle, and they get ideas. Ideas like independence and revolution and self-determination. The shift to the modern era from the Middle Ages is the intellectual, philosophical, emotional, and psychosociological responses to the tyranny of the church and the crown, a refutation of the accepted authority that had dominated the narratives of history and thus society. So we have the so-called Age of Discovery, the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment. We move from organizing society around the authority of God to the authority of science, logic, reason, the laws of nature. And it's from the Enlightenment that we get liberalism, the distinction and elevation of the individual over the masses. It's revolutionary for the time. The idea that humankind isn't just a sinful, shameful shit stain to be squished under the shoe of a hateful and angry god, but actually a collection of unique individuals, each entitled to agency and distinct from one another. But like it does with all good and revolutionary things, power corrupts and it destroys. In economics, we see this in the rise of mercantilism, a system replacing god with money, supplanting kings with merchants, trading crusades for colonialism. In politics, this is the emergence of the nation-state, the result of systemic power shifting and rearranging on a global scale through conquest and trade. And then the Age of Revolutions, wherein colonies and countries declare and fight for independence and the right to govern themselves, so goes the rhetoric. In art, literature, music, theater, poetry, and architecture, the neoclassicism of the old world is challenged by romanticism. In science and technology, the Industrial Revolution. But as we should hopefully all know by now to some degree, individualism is neither good revolutionary praxis nor a sound philosophical foundation for organizing society around. We tried that. We called it the American Experiment. It didn't 
didn't work. America is and has always been a tax haven built upon an economic cornerstone of unpaid labor created by rich merchants who tricked poor white working class into thinking that A, black slaves and indigenous Americans were their enemies instead of their potential class comrades, and B, that the lofty legalese penned by these rich capitalist fucks actually had their interests in mind. Fuck going back in time to kill Hitler. I'd take this whole goddamn convention down with that has more legally protected rights than women do in America today, thanks to them. Irony can be so painful. Basically, by the late 19th century, the world is crumbling under the weight of civilization and its worsening imbalances of power, and the strange paradox at the heart of the whole system becomes ever clearer, a system that no status quo has ever been able to satisfactorily answer. If things are going so well, why does everything still feel so bad? Why is there still so much suffering? If the grain silos are full, why are so many still going hungry? If the economy is so great, why does nobody have any money? If we can cure diseases that have virtually wiped us out in the past, why are so many people dying what, of what could have been easily preventable plagues. Nothing we can relate to today, of course, but just try to use your imagination. While the systems of power that plague us have clear historical patterns, empires rise and fall, rebrand, they rise, they rinse, they repeat, history is not a flat circle, it's a spiral. The thing that changes our world is human perspective, not any individual's perspective because those have always been fluid, fickle, and all over the place, but our collective perspective as a species, it's self-awareness, social consciousness. How aware is humankind of the paradox, the fact that things are far more fucked up than they actually have to be. This conundrum and the impulse we have to unravel it, it creates conversation. History is not a series of events, it's an inconceivably vast web of conversations happening over and over again, ever since we were living, painting, and dreaming in caves. Yeah, so we've been fighting and killing each other throughout history, but more importantly, we keep talking to each other. We've been talking to each other longer than we've fought wars. We've been talking longer than we've had slavery. We've been talking to each other as long as we've been what we would call human. Arguably, it's the thing that makes us human. This is how we survive, creating connection between human beings, talking to each other about our experiences and feelings and thoughts and ideas. This is how we grow, move beyond our comfort zones. We communicate with the strangers whose lives and experiences are so vastly different from ours, but who we can recognize is the exact same animals we are. And in the late 19th century, there are quite a few wild conversations happening, dozens of mind-boggling hot takes from those allowed to participate in discourse the century before. Takes that shift our thinking and make the idea of all humankind as a collective entity more conceivable. Humans are animals responding to our environments, and the only existential purpose we have is to simply survive. No destination, duty, or destiny. The power of the few is sustained by the labor of the many. This is an abusive and toxic relationship, and it's time to break up. God is dead. Right is wrong. Rules are for pussies. Please don't leave my legacy in the hands of my Nazi cunt sister. One plus negative one equals two. Why are all of our brains so fucked up? Why are they all fucked up in similar ways? <sighs> Get back on the couch, let's find out. You can make pictures move! And these takes, these conversations, lay the ground for what we call modernism. Modernism is a nebulous soup of ideas, values, philosophies, characterize the art, culture, technology, politics, socioeconomics of the first half of the 20th century. I personally consider modernism as properly beginning with the invention of cinema in 1895 to the invention of the atomic bomb in 1945. Birth of our ability to construct reality to the birth of our ability to utterly destroy it. Again, massively oversimplified because it's a bit hard to encapsulate an idea characterizing nearly every shifting aspect of our society over the span of half a century, but modernism essentially professes that underneath all of our differences, conflicts, and contradictions, there is a collective pan-human experience connecting all of us, and that's something that we're capable of discovering and grasping. Modernism is a massive cultural shift of self and social awareness that originates in art, as all social mutations that aid our evolution do. There's a phrase, literature precedes the law, meaning the rules of society don't define who we are or determine what we do, the rules are written in response to who we are and what we do. Human art, thought, and imagination are what actually makes our world work, while law is fundamentally reactionary. Ergo, the rules are made up, and why shouldn't we change them if they no longer helpfully describe us and how we should be organized? Modernism's kaleidoscopic interpretations of reality are still very much around today, but they are not all there is because we've had a busy 75 years since we dropped those bombs. Because we modernize and grow so fast 
last in such a short time, the status quo reasserts itself equally viciously by igniting and maintaining a constant state of war. The rise of fascism, the modernization of capitalism, side by side with modernism's progress, revolution, and institutional upheaval. The world wars begin and escalate, global powers collide, and modernity's vast ocean of relativity becomes deeper and wider and scarier by the year. And then the breaking point. Fascism reaches its only logical ending point, and we figure out the most efficient way of killing as many human beings as possible, and it fucks up the entire world. Our thinking becomes postmodern. Self-referentiality, moral and philosophical relativism, irony, irreverence, deconstruction, pluralism, pastiche, nihilism. I'm a modern man, a man for the millennium, digital and smoke-free, a diversified multicultural postmodern deconstruction is politically, anatomically, and ecologically incorrect. I've been uplinked and downloaded, I've been inputted and outsourced, I know the upside of downsizing, I know the downside of upgrading. I'm a high-tech lowlife, a cutting-edge, state-of-the-art, bi-coastal, multitasker, and I can give you a gigabyte in a nanosecond. I'm new wave, but I'm old school, and my inner child is outward bound. I'm a hot-wired, heat-seeking, warm-hearted, cool customer, voice activated and biodegradable. I interface with my database, my database is in cyberspace, so I'm interactive, I'm hyperactive, and from time to time I'm radioactive. A raging workaholic, a working rageaholic, out of rehab and in denial. I'm a non-believer and an overachiever, laid back but fashion forward, up front, down home, low rent, high maintenance, supersized, long-lasting, high-definition, fast-acting, oven-ready, and built to last. I bought a microwave at a mini-mall, I bought a minivan at a megastore, I eat fast food in the slow lane, a fully equipped, factory-authorized, hospital-tested, clinically proven, scientifically formulated medical miracle. I've been pre-washed, pre-cooked, pre-heated, pre-screened, pre-approved, pre-packaged, post-dated, freeze-dried, double-wrapped, vacuum-packed, and I have an unlimited broadband capacity. The modern says reality is a boundless multiplicity of narratives all equally valuable all the rules are made up and figuring out the things we're capable of when transcending them is existentially exciting and promising the postmodernist says reality is a boundless multiplicity of narratives all equally meaningless all the rules are made up and figuring out what we're capable of when transcending them is existentially dreadful and absurd and how best to sum up the postmodern madness of the latter half of the 20th century c'est l'histoire d'un homme qui tombe d'un immeuble de 50 étages Le mec, au fur et à mesure de sa chute, il se répète sans cesse pour se rassurer. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Mais l'important, c'est pas la chute. C'est l'atterrissage. We fall for 50 years until the cynicism and nihilism of postmodernism peak at the turn of the century. One minute, we're watching The Matrix at our Y2K party, acknowledging how bullshit society is while waiting for the world to end, while the Battle of Seattle rages outside of a World Trade Center, fighting desperately to save or salvage humankind's future. In the next minute, we're hungover and wallowing in the wreckage of another World Trade Center, while the American Empire mobilizes the West and declares the next chapter of the never-ending war, during which we still have to get up every day, go to work, and just pretend that things are okay, because this war machine doesn't run itself. As we learned early in the aughts, there are consequences to spending decades being desensitized to meaning, emotion, and sincerity, and treating the end of the world like a fucking spectacle. And this was before social media and the modern internet. I can't blame this shit on them. This all came from a very ugly place. And even now, it feels like we keep expecting it to fall to pieces. You say the whole world's ending. But it doesn't. Honey, it, already did. it hasn't actually ended, and I, I, I don't think it will. If one can make a reasonable induction, it's that we will continue to go on. Committing to nihilistic postmodern doomerism, even after we've grown and gone through what feels like multiple apocalypses, it's not a great look in the long term. It's adolescent, and at this point, it's downright childish. So what comes next? In 2007, Alexandra Dimitrescu describes metamodernism as an emergence from and reaction to postmodernism, championing the idea that only in their interconnection and continuous revision lie the possibility of grasping the nature of contemporary cultural and literary phenomena. In their 2010 essay, Notes on Metamodernism, cultural theorists Timotheus Vermeulen and Robin Vandenacker further expound upon the metamodern sensibility as a kind of informed naivete, a pragmatic idealism, where grand narratives are as necessary as they are problematic 
Hope is not simply something to distrust. Love not necessarily something to be ridiculed. They assert that relativism, irony, and pastiche have been replaced by engagement, affect, and storytelling through ironic sincerity. They describe metamodernism as a structure of feeling that oscillates between modernist thought and postmodernist thought, embracing doubt as well as hope and melancholy, sincerity and irony, affect and apathy, the personal and the political. Metamodernism is not so much a philosophy as it is an attempt at an open source document that might contextualize and explain what's going on around us, in political economy as much as in the arts. Modernism to postmodernism to metamodernism is a widening of perspective, not a linear progression of thought. It's a dialectic model. Remember, one plus negative one equals two. Truth is syncretized from two contradictory realities being reconciled. Schrodinger's cat can simultaneously be alive and dead. Art can simultaneously be ironic and sincere. One. We recognize oscillation to be the natural order of the world. 2. We must liberate ourselves from the inertia resulting from a century of modernist ideological naivete and the cynical insincerity of its antonymous bastard child. 3. Movement shall henceforth be enabled by way of an oscillation between positions, with diametrically opposed ideas operating like the pulsating polarities of a colossal electric machine, propelling the world into action. Four. We acknowledge the limitations inherent to all movement and experience, and the futility of any attempt to transcend the boundaries set forth therein. The essential incompleteness of a system should necessitate an adherence, not in order to achieve a given end or be slaves to its course, but rather perchance to glimpse by proxy some hidden exteriority. Existence is enriched if we set about our task as if those limits might be exceeded, for such action unfolds the world. 5. All things are caught within the irrevocable slide toward a state of maximum entropic dissemblance. Artistic creation is contingent upon the origination or revelation of difference therein. Affect at its zenith is the unmediated experience of difference in itself. It must be art's role to explore the promise of its own paradoxical ambition by coaxing excess towards presence. 6. The present is a symptom of the twin birth of immediacy and obsolescence. Today, we are nostalgists as much as we are futurists. The new technology enables the simultaneous experience and enactment of events from a multiplicity of positions. Far from signaling its demise, these emergent networks facilitate the democratization of history, illuminating the forking paths along which its grand narratives may navigate the here and now. 7. Just as science strives for poetic elegance, artists might assume a quest for truth. All information is grounds for knowledge, whether empirical or aphoristic, no matter its truth value. We should embrace the scientific poetic synthesis and informed naivete of a magical realism. Error breeds sense. 8. We propose a pragmatic romanticism, unhindered by ideological anchorage. Thus, metamodernism shall be defined as the mercurial condition between and beyond irony and sincerity, naivete and knowingness, relativism and truth, optimism, and doubt. In pursuit of a plurality of disparate and elusive horizons, we must go forth and oscillate. The Metamodernist Manifesto was published in 2011, while Vermeulen and Vandenacker's Notes on Metamodernism was published a year before in 2010. And at the very same time Metamodernism was being popularized in the discourse, comedy, the lowest, most vulgar, and common of the arts, procured her first thoroughly metamodernist comic from a place no one expected. Not a seasoned comedian, not even a full-grown adult, but a white Catholic schoolboy from Massachusetts who's really good with words and really, really isn't gay, no matter what his family thinks. To say that culture wasn't really ready for Bo Burnham's metamodern brand of comedy, an unusual blend of bald sarcasm and heartfelt sincerity, is an understatement. Even his older millennial peers didn't really seem to get it when he talked about the self-consciousness of perpetual performance as demanded by our late capitalist social media entertainment culture. Of course, these were the same people who were surprised by the unexpected subject matter of his debut film, 8th Grade. I wanted to write about my anxiety, so I sat down and tried to buckshot a bunch of scenes with a bunch of different characters, not knowing what it was going to be. And I stumbled on the voice of this kid and her dad. I wrote a scene of them driving to the mall and her not wanting him to look weird when they were driving and him not knowing what she meant by that. And it was just immediately very alive to me. It felt more real than anything else I was writing. 
in 2018, the people who really understood Bo Burnham weren't the ones running media discourse, because they were all still in high school. She's a proxy for how I feel now, how I navigate my own anxiety, how it feels like to navigate the world now. And it just happened to be, for some reason, a 13-year-old, 8th grade girl that felt like the perfect conduit for what I felt like it feels like to be alive right now. I mentioned before that the bulk of Bo Burnham's earlier fan base was young girls, historically the most reliable and catered to consumers. But that is the danger of social media to me. There is you and then there is the other you. There is the idea of you. There is the story of you. The danger is not that we're going to treat the internet like it's real. The danger is that we're treating the real world like it's the internet and you're walking through an experience as a kid and you're also hovering over yourself watching your experience from afar because that's how people will consume it you watch people watch your experience you watch other people in the room watch you watch them you're nostalgic for the experience as you're in it because you're thinking of how it'll be processed after the fact it's disassociative and strange and weird and that leads to anxiety and weird feelings this feeling he's describing that part of our mind that floats above us removed and hyper aware of everything we do and say our third eye our super ego simply our sense of persistent self-awareness, whatever you want to call it. This is what the metamodern human mind looks like. This is your brain on metamodernism. This is the difference between the chuckle fucks who unironically bump Bezos 1 as a pro Amazon song, and those to whom it is almost painfully obvious that these interludes are simultaneously barely concealed venomous criticism and hilarious parody that speaks to its own absurdity. Jeffrey Bezos, you did it! This isn't a joke. This isn't a joke. This is the crux of all of Bo Burnham's comedy. Inside is Burnham's thesis on metamodernism, i.e. on how it feels to be alive and participate in society today. Bagel! I won't lie, while 2020 was as chaotic, confusing, and terrifying for me as it was for any of us, it was also one of the best years I've been alive. I feel like a total asshole for admitting that, especially because it was such a monumentally difficult time for so many. But there was something extraordinarily satisfying seeing capitalism outright fail as hard as it did in the face of the pandemic. And this was only amplified by the radical social justice movements that also exploded that year. Un fucking precedented. Of course, capitalism collapsing, while it is overall positive, the practical cost of its failure is the lives of the most marginalized under it. So many people have already died, disproportionately communities of color, especially their disabled, queer, and trans members. And as the system continues collapsing, only more will die, if not from preventable pandemics and constant wars, then starvation and homelessness and climate disasters. So it's fucked to want to dance in these ashes, right? How to reconcile this, how to live with this dual awareness, how to not kill ourselves when we're born with blood on our hands. For the metamodern human, the metahuman, this conflicted state of mind is not a conundrum or a philosophical problem to be solved, but a fact of everyday life. We changed. That year changed us. It may be a big claim to make, but I would argue that the pandemic has impacted this world as consequentially as the atom bomb did. We just don't yet have the historical hindsight to really grasp it on a large scale. Remember what we were saying about the evolution of human society? It's conversation, it's discourse, it's discussion. People fucking talking to each other, talking about our feelings and experiences and shared struggles. How did Black Lives Matter happen? The mainstream started talking about- well, the white mainstream started listening and then began discussing the tradition of racial injustice and anti-blackness that has been institutionalized longer than the United States has existed that we spent a long time refusing to talk about. How did Me Too happen? It was a discussion stemming from shared public responses to shared private oppressions at the hands of the powerful. Over half of the human population stood up and started talking about the things we weren't talking about in the open, like the fact that the insidious long-standing power imbalances and abuses of our system of gender have persisted and continue to hold fast well into the 21st century and say whatever we will about the Trump presidency at least the dirty fascist laundry came out so we could finally address the stench and you know why the right has been freaking out about gender liberation why trans and gender non-conforming people have seen a sharp rise in visibility in recent years it's because we're talking about gender now its subjectivity and fluidity its problematic constructed nature as a binary biological taxonomy black lives matter and me too are 
are conversations. Trans people and gender are conversations. Fascism is a conversation, as is anti-fascism. Critical race theory is a conversation. Bodily autonomy and abortion rights are conversations. Joe Rogan, true crime, the MCU, white liberal girl boss feminism, and the British royal family are conversations. Memes are essentially just conversational units. Social media is a medium of conversation. Fuck, the whole modern internet is, is built on a need for communication. And the thing that made 2020 feel so revolutionary, even hopeful for me, was the conversations we started having. Like, defund the police, or universal basic income, or anarchism as a feasible political position. Even just a year before that, those conversations would have been figments of only the most optimistic of progressives' fantasies. And yet, we live in a post-defund the police world. They're not actually defend defunded, we never did that, but like, it's in our vocabulary now. I know I'm not the only one who was disappointed when we restarted the machine in 2021, when we went back to normal. When we rebooted the Matrix and the machine literally turned around and tried gaslighting us into thinking that it never happened, that we didn't see it flicker and fail, that we didn't see the real sky for the first time in memory. And I know I'm not the only one who felt like this because at the height of this post-apocalyptic existential horror of back to normal, one of my longtime favorite artists crawled out of his cave, bearded and gentle-eyed as a religious hermit, and gave us inside. To say I felt seen would be an understatement. Just like he had done with Make Happy in 8th grade before, Bo Burnham validated everything that I had been feeling. That metamodern doublethink required to accept the illusory nature of everything the status quo holds dear while still having to pretend it matters by going to work and trying to laugh off the absurdity of it all. Or rather, that funny feeling. See, like many of my generation, I was a perpetually sad kid because my childhood was nothing but one disillusionment after another as I learned more and more of how fucked up the world is. And this is something I think Bo Burnham and I have in common. Again, I don't know Bo Burnham as a person, but I've known him through his art for a long time, and I can confidently say that he gets it. He knows what's fucked up about the world and he's messed up about it. He gets the guilt. He sees the blood on his and all of our hands. Don't you know the world is built with blood? He knows what it's like to be paralyzed by the same sort of internal voices, anxiety, depression, and debilitating self-consciousness that I suffer from. He knows how it feels to be expected to laugh while the world is on fire. That's the thing. I'm not special for this. Neither is Bo. Be the first person to confirm that. Well, my phone makes me sad. Because these are feelings I feel safe saying that basically all of us have been feeling in one way or the other, especially lately. There's a reason why the response to Inside has been so thunderous, especially from younger online communities. I'm younger than Bo, but I'm still on the older end of the zillennial spectrum, and if the way this metamodern tension has impacted me, as someone who vaguely remembers life before social media culture, I can only imagine how ingrained it is in the average Zoomer, never even mind the rapidly growing next generation. If Inside resonates with me so deeply, how must it read to the generations most historically, cognitively equipped to receive it? Observant viewers will note that I haven't actually elaborated on Inside and what makes it great yet, and... I don't think I will. Go check out my letterbox reviews if you want to see me dissect all the clever shit I found. Or better yet, watch the video essays by your favorite internet personalities about it, but also go follow me on Letterbox. Because the valuable thing about Inside to me isn't its superficial brilliant elements, things that I could explain in detail for you to wow you or give you some new insight into the text. What's important to it is, is what it means to me, emotionally and artistically. Maybe you're disappointed to get this far to realize I'm not I'm really talking about inside, but that's what you're here for. You most likely already have your opinion on inside. If you don't like it, I'm not changing your mind. And if you do like it, I'm not somehow gonna radically reframe your perspective on it. No, you're here because you wanted to hear someone talk about it. Because you're a metamodern human being too. And in a metamodernist world, it's the conversation that matters. Truth is relative. Art is subjective. Reality is a multiplicity of coexisting contradictions. The divorce between what possibilities we're capable of imagining and what our failed system is capable of actually manifesting. That's where our humanity makes itself clearest and we talk to make sense of that paradox. The whole medium of video essays is a metamodernist one, one that I think beautifully embodies what really matters to us, what really compels us to create, share, and analyze art. Communication. I think we much prefer engaging with others about art than, like, the experiencing of art itself. Shit, in a metamodernist world like ours, discussing art 
is an essential part of experiencing it. The reason we enjoy watching things like that god-awful YouTube reviewer whose name I'm deliberately forgetting for comedic effects videos that are three times longer than the movies themselves, and like Quentin reviews over 24-hour Nickelodeon Cinematic Universe deep dive. It's an extended time spent immersed in a metatextual conversation between these reviewers and the most reactionary and emotionally immature non-derogatory parts of our brain. On other sides of the spectrum, you have creators like CJDX, one of the metamodernists who did an extraordinary video essay on Inside. In Bo Burnham vs. Jeff Bezos, notable for being over twice as long as Inside itself, they pick out and dissect an element of the special and analytically implodes it into a sprawling existential thesis on being alive right now in a world where human connection is increasingly parasocial and unprecedentedly dependent on and mediated by capitalism through social media. Like Bo Burnham, CJ's performance and rhetoric is built on the dialectic of metamodernism, an oscillation between sincerity and irony, performed authenticity, and purposeful antagonism. He's actually the only person who enforces the performance audience divide consciously with outright hostility as much as I do. They're an asshole on purpose to provoke and drive a discussion they've written to a specific end. This sort of artistic expression and criticism appeals to us on a personal level. CJ the X is just one example of this kind of performer who make you feel like you're in the room listening to them go on about a special interest. These creators are all over the place. On another side of the spectrum, debate streamers are only ever yelling at each other as a sport rather than any like practical discourse. We still eat that shit up. Twitter? Twitter is a platform specifically designed to exploit our need to communicate through our worst emotional impulses. It's what makes us human. Art's value is ultimately grounded in its communicative potential. Art is just not nearly as interesting to us as talking to people about art is. I've had a lot of people laugh at me when I've tried defending the concept of content cinema or the potential of video essays and commentary content as an emerging art form instrumental to the wider metamodernist artistic movement we're living through. But they can laugh all they like. No one took cinema seriously as art until its value as historical revisionist propaganda was realized. And if the radicalization of the internet over the past decade has taught us anything, it's that content very, very much has the power to influence minds, rewrite history, and resurrect traditions, myths, and ideas ideologies that should remain extinct. Maybe this isn't just a joke. Maybe it's something we should take a bit more seriously. Now don't get me wrong, metamodernism and metamodernist art has been around for a couple of decades. Like everything else in this peak content era, the age of everything all of the time, most of it is most of it's dog shit. No one needs me to tell them that a majority of content on YouTube alone is substanceless at best, actively damaging and toxic at worst. This is the reason that everyone is always harping on about media literacy. In a media-driven world, wherein most media is fucking garbage, media literacy is pretty fucking important. Conscious consumption is the key to surviving in the metamodern world. Take control of your little ghost. Choose to watch media critically, while simultaneously allowing yourself to be open enough for it to incite the responses it's meant to. You're a metahuman. That's your fucking superpower. You can learn to deep dive into the endless ocean of content without drowning. You can't stop yourself from feelings and convictions, but you can learn to be aware of them and handle them constructively. Obviously, I'm an advocate of people consuming YouTube content. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. But for the love of fuck, search for and find the intellectuals and artists out there who are challenging the status quo, who are trying to change the world by helping us make some sense of it, not just using our lack of emotional self-awareness to exploit our feelings of fear, pain, and outrage to get more clout. Hot take. The early 21st century metamodern equivalent of the early 20th century metamodernists aren't the novelists and indie filmmakers of the day, but content creators, internet critics, and video essayists. Left Tube is metamodernism's lost generation. ContraPoints is basically the T.S. Eliot of video essays. Honestly, I think Left Tube is a synecdoche of the much wider net of progressive and socially constructive creators on the platform. The ones aiming to enrich viewers and change the world in a positive way. Really, Left Tube just kind of means any content creator who has any sort of vaguely decent politics. You can't make a film capable of reaching wide audiences without millions upon millions of the capitalist dollars. Even Inside would have never reached as wide an audience as it did if it wasn't distributed by evil media corporation Netflix. Capitalist realism has conquered the medium of cinema, like it's conquered all of our institutions of art. The only place where meaningful innovation and cultural evolution can come from now, as it ultimately always has been, is from the margins. 
for marginalized creators. For example, the first left tube wave, so-called bread tube, comprised of multiple queer, femme, and trans creators. Yes, it's, um, it's kind of white, but this is what the revolution on YouTube looked like five years ago. Thankfully, we live in a post-bread tube world, a woke world to commandeer the rights preferred nomenclature for the visible cultural presence of women queers and non-white folk oh make no mistake we're in the middle of a post-pandemic content renaissance led by a vanguard of countless bipoc creators who have managed to acquire large audiences in spite of youtube's well-documented targeted suppression against non-white non cishet creators channels the explosive proliferation of black creatives and intellectuals on the platform alone has been astounding to watch. The point is, we all only have a frighteningly limited amount of time, energy, and attention to devote to the unfathomable depths of eternal content, and to never let ourselves get so immersed in any discourse or community without losing sight of the big picture. That we're all connected inside of a system that does not have our best interests at heart, and that, above all else, nothing matters but other people. The real reason this video has taken so long to make, outside of, you know, material circumstances, has been that I don't know how to end it. Endings are always the most difficult part of any story, and yet they're the most essential. Whether a film, novel, or creative nonfiction essay like this, an ending frames the messages of a work of art. You literally cannot understand what a story is trying to say without understanding its ending. Usually I'm better at endings, conceptually at least, because I make videos to say things. So when I write, I generally begin at the end with my message as, as clear and lucid as I can make it, and then I spend the writing process going on the journey to get to that point. With this essay though, there's so many things I've wanted to say, because again, this video isn't ultimately about Bo Burnham, it's about the world we live in, the world that must matter to us, the world we must not stumble through carelessly. It's a subject I have a lot to say about. It's basically my whole channel's premise, trying to connect our media to the real world, one that is increasingly exploited to sustain and weaponize the digital world. Bo Burnham's work is saying these exact same things. But how do you end it? How do you end anything? The reason it's so hard, Burnham says so himself at the end of the Inside Out takes. The thing that I'm writing about is an ending, so it's hard to end whatever this is. What we're trying to talk about isn't ending. That's essentially what the outtakes are. They're an attempt at an ending. Because Inside was very open-ended, suggesting potential for a future, an uncertain, albeit marginally optimistic one, and the outtakes are a, a frame to situate Inside within. And of course, it's a fundamentally incomplete one, as any story about real life must end as. And as any content creator will tell you, the creative process shown through the outtakes is a very real, very monotonous, very labor-intensive, and very frustrating. Bo just managed to make it look really good, because he's a damn good artist. As far as ending the outtakes, Burnham opts for multiple endings, multiple frames for us to work with, multiple meanings and messages we can extract from inside. And remember our superpowers. We're metahumans, so we're capable of reconciling multiple realities together, even seemingly contradictory ones. So first, he just ends it. He does what all artists must inevitably do when they put their work out into the world, decide the damn thing is finished. I'm, I've decided that I'm going to stop doing this. Anticlimactic, but very direct, straightforward, respectable. And then the ending that follows the path Bo Burnham and all of us that are even slightly in touch with reality can see before us. <laughs> climate crisis we've been studiously ignoring for 50 some odd years, but still, it's not over. I know the last song seemed like it should have been the last song, but this is actually the last song. Bo Burnham encapsulates the essence of his art and his messages rather simply, with the original joke that's not actually a joke. A life of brighter days, a width of road away, so that's why she did. Yeah. It's yet another reiteration of why Bo does what he does. He's trying to find happiness. He's trying to get to the other side, where his Pringles are waiting in a can wide enough for his hand to fit in. Is Bo the chicken? Yes. Is the chicken metaphor related to his hypothetical daughter metaphor? Yes. But at the end of the day, aren't we all the chicken, desperate to reach the other side, but trapped in these roasting headlights? Yes. 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 The chicken story is yet another open ending. We can choose to believe that we're doomed, like many, many of us do, or we can believe that she survives and makes it to the other side. Maybe we can be happy. Maybe we can, you know, 
get through this? Or maybe we can choose to believe the truth in both of these things simultaneously. Less known about The Chicken is that it isn't a new song. Back as early as 2016, Bo would end his shows with an encore performance of this song. It's a story he's been telling for a long time, and now he's finally, like, officially shared it with all of us, leaving this all-important story in our hands. Like the whole outtakes themselves, The Chicken illustrates that the story, our third act, our dialectical synthesis, it isn't in fiction. It's in the real world. It's real people. It's me, and it's you, and it's everyone, and it's all of our fragile little lives and communities. It makes the excellent point, one we cannot forget in this age of infinite content. If our art doesn't connect us to the real world and the people in it, then it's not worth our time. Fuck it. Human creativity and content are functionally unlimited. Human beings are not. Oh yeah, and then there's the last ending, that very grim and sardonic reality check. Acknowledging the reality that even this piece of art exists in the same system that runs off the same dysfunctional logic as Hollywood and the MCU. <laughs> they have our futures determined. Their claims are already staked. <laughs> The market's insistence on attempting to keep us ensnared and hypnotized, even as it becomes less and less capable of doing so, looks increasingly ridiculous. And to everyone who is trying to predict when Inside 2 is dropping next year, or is expecting that to happen, like, at all, please stop. Please go to therapy. Because the mouse has fucked up your brain. I, I kinda mean- I mean that, sort of, sincerely. But this seems like a radical shift in tone from the sincerity of the chicken to the wry cynicism of the idea of the ICU. Well, that's metamodernism. Truth one. The moral of this story is that real life happens outside of fiction and it doesn't just end. Life keeps going. Truth two. The entertainment media market has taken this life always goes on principle and applied it to our fiction in order to make it simulate reality in a convincing enough way that we will continue to spend our money on it for the next, well, as long as we don't run out of fuel. How do we respond to these dual realities? Should we take charge of our story, decide to finish crossing the road to a better world? Should we stay inside and let predatory media corporations and grown men in baseball caps write our futures for us? I joked about therapy, but like seriously, if anyone took this ICU part seriously, is this something you really want? Or is it something you think you want because you've been taught to ask for this from the art you love and consume? Think about that. For my part though, I'd rather cross the road. Fuck Kevin Feige.